Hi, um, today I'll be talking about assessing the ecological and human health status of Baltimore's Inner Harbor and its watershed. Um, my co-authors are Heath Kelsey, Lori Schwartz, Bill Stack, and Bill Dennison. Um, at the outline of my talk, um, first I'm going to introduce you to Baltimore Harbor and its watershed, orient you to the area. Um, and ho hopefully the, my talk will answer the question, what is the current health of the Inner Harbor? To start, um, we uh, had a data workshop in November 2010 um, where we got all the different f local, federal, um, state agencies, nonprofit organizations, anyone that we thought may be monitoring some kind of data in the harbor. Um, and we uh, got them in the room together and really started talking about um, what we could do with the data. Um, and it was really cool because they hadn't really met each other before, so it was nice to get them in the room together so they can collaborate. Over the last six months, we've been um, getting the data from the providers, um, analyzing the data, and then compiling it and synthesizing it into a report. And so the report is actually in its final stages and will be printed over the next couple weeks. And um, the Waterfront Partnership is doing a launch in mid-September with all their information. So uh, to orient you to where we're talking about this um, inset map, um, here's the Chesapeake Bay. Um, the state of Maryland, and this is the Patapsco River. Right now we're just south of here. Um, so the Patapsco River is a tidal, um, a tidal tributary to the Chesapeake. Um, and then um, for this, study, uh, this talk and the study site that we looked at um, is at the top of the t tidal portion of the Patapsco. And um, the two major river systems are the Jones Falls Creek um, and the Gwynns Falls Watershed Creek. Um, and you can see the streams that come down those watersheds. And then we also have the Direct Harbor Watershed, which um, is the land that drains directly into the tidal portion. Um, and our study sites are the Inner, the inner Harbor, which is this small par portion of the tidal Patapsco, and then the Middle Branch. And that's because these watersheds drain directly into those areas. Just to further orient you, some of the major road systems um, and the city and the county borders, the Baltimore City encompasses some of the watersheds um, and the entire Direct Harbor watershed that we were looking at. Um, this is the beltway around Baltimore. And then some of the major su suburbs, um, Towson, Maryland, and Owings Mill, Maryland, are in each of the watersheds. And we're down here in Anne Arundel County right now. So Baltimore is a historic urban city. Um, it was founded as a port city in the early 1700s. Um, the Jones Falls Expressway, which is I-83, was completed in the 1980s and it was literally built parallel and on top of Jones Falls Creek. Um, the outflow is directly into the Inner Harbor between Pier 6 and Falls Avenue, just downtown where the aquarium is. And the Jones Falls was bulkheaded as far back as the mid-1800s, and I think these pictures really illustrate that point. Um, this picture is from um, the Civil War, just looking down on the Inner Harbor, you can see um, there's no green space. Um, and the Jones Falls, this is looking up the Jones Falls and how it's been bulkheaded um, for quite a long time. But there is this gradient from low to high impervious surface um, in the watersheds. So this is an, a map of impervious surface. Um, the upper Jones Falls watershed is actually pretty, um, uh, has low impervious surface. And then as you come down the watersheds towards the downtown, um, you can see the increasing amounts of impervious surface and the direct harbor watershed is almost completely impervious surface. And this is also reflected in the land use. So the direct harbor has almost 100% developed land. Whereas you can see the, the Jones Falls actually has some forest and ag as well. So um, further um, getting you um, to know the study regions, um, harbor can mean different things, especially for the people that live in Baltimore. So the inner harbor for most people actually just means the tourist area downtown with the uh, aquarium, the Maryland Science Museum. Um, so that's one section that is people call the inner harbor. This um, whole area, um, which is the northwest branch of the Patapsco, um, is usually referred to as Baltimore Harbor, and that's because of the shipping industry, the port industry. So that whole part is called Baltimore Harbor, usually. This area, again, is the middle branch area, um, and is usually, it's actually still part of Baltimore City and is a um, pretty uh, developed area as well. And then this is the tidal Patapsco River, and this is actually below our study sites. 
So what we ended up doing was choosing the Baltimore Harbor, which this entire subregion we, we're going to call the Inner Harbor, and then this area of the Middle Branch, and so that's the Middle Branch subregion that we looked at. So the two subregions are the Middle Branch and Inner Harbor, and initially what we did was we just plotted all the sampling sites that were in these areas. And it looks like there's quite a bit for such a small area. These areas are only one to two kilometers um, um, in area. And, um, uh, but then when we, we looked um, just at the water quality data, there's only one water quality um, station and it's here in the Inner Harbor subregion. So our Middle Branch subregion has no water quality data at this time. So um, just really quickly, I'm going to go through the methods. Um, I, we can talk about this more after the talk, but um, basically uh, we use mostly 2009 data for this um, study uh, right now. Um, that was the most current data that I could get from the data providers. We used ecologically relevant thresholds um, that were determined through the Bayride report card and the MTAC protocol. So the Mid-Atlantic Tributary Assessment Coalition um, has developed a tidal protocol um, for indicators in the tidal regions of the Mid-Atlantic. So what we did is you take the data and you compare data values to um, the threshold value and you mark it as either pass or fail. Um, but we have actually developed multiple threshold in, um, multiple thresholds for indicators. So instead of just saying, well, uh, dissolved oxygen is good or dissolved oxygen is bad, well, we can say it's really bad, it's bad, it's fair, it's good, and it gives you a better, a more detailed look at um, the, the data. And this is just an example of our chlorophyll A multiple thresholds table. We then um, change all the scoring to a 0 to 100% scale so that they can be compared to each other and averaged. So what are our indicators? Um, the indicators for the tidal portion are dissolved oxygen, chlorophyll A, water clarity, total nitrogen, and total phosphorus. These are the water quality um, indicators and those are um, pretty common for this, these kinds of areas. Um, and then um, we looked at benthic macroinvertebrates, um, submerged aquatic vegetation or seagrasses. And also we looked at toxic contaminants in the soil, uh, the sediment. Um, we then uh, rolled up the water quality indicators into a water quality index. And I'll go through each one of these. So for dissolved oxygen, uh, there was 2009 and 2010 data, and because there was only one site, we decided to use all the data available. Um, and we, uh, you can see the low seasonal pattern, um, the seasonal pattern in the summertime. Um, and then what we do is we have different thresholds for the different areas of the water, open water, deep water, deep channel. And then um, we score it against those thresholds. And we came out with an overall score of 32.8%, which is rated a poor. Same thing for chlorophyll A. These are all at the same station. Um, the spring 2010 increases um, very quickly, but you can see how few data points there really are. So that's a question to see if that's going to continue. Um, and so overall, this scored a 41.8%, which is also a, a poor. Um, water clarity um, also scored about the same as chlorophyll A. Um, and these are just showing the different thresholds that we use. Uh, total nitrogen scored very poorly. Um, it, it was 11.4% passed. Those were the only ones that passed. And total phosphorus did slightly better with a 22.9%, but it's still considered poor. So overall, what we did is we scored these indicators and you just averaged them straight into a water quality index for the Inner Harbor region. And that was a 30.1%, which is a poor score, um, which um, is um, makes sense with the different indicator scores. And then, like I said, the Middle Branch region did not have any data, so we did not score that. So the other indicators we looked at, benthic macroinvertebrates. Um, the Chesapeake Bay program has a benthic IBI um, program, and so they had data from 2009 that was, uh, there were two data points in the Inner, re uh, inner Harbor su uh, subregion, and they both scored the lowest score possible on the BB um, index. So that was, so then converted to R scale, that's a very poor. Um, submerged aquatic vegetation, 
does not occur in these areas and hasn't for a very long time. And so um, while they don't really score it, we consider that very poor um, because we hope to in the future actually bring them back um, in different areas. So we wanted to at least start out with a baseline of zero. Um, and uh, for toxic um, contaminants, there was a study done by Maryland Sea Grant. They looked at um, using dredged material from the channels um, in uh, aquatic restoration use. So for instance, making new um, wetland habitat and things like that. And so we, we looked at their data and um, none of the samples that they took passed for either metals or pHs um, at all. So that scored a very poor as well. Um, while we usually just look at ecological indicators, um, this group particularly um, wants to know about human health and aesthetics. And Baltimore is a very urban city, and so bacteria and trash are a serious problems there. And then we actually just also had fish toxicity data, which was interesting to look at. So bacteria, this indicator um, answers the question, is it safe to swim in the harbor? We looked at 2009 enterococci concentrations. That's the indicator bacteria we use in um, saltwater systems. And <clears throat> there's an actually a great sampling program um, already being um, done by the Waterkeeper program in Baltimore. And these are their um, stations averages. So I averaged them over the entire season. And then I averaged them, those averages into an overall inner harbor subregion um, score, which is poor. And um, actually, the Middle Branch looks better than the Inner Harbor and scored a fair, which is our, one of our best grades. <laughs> um, trash, the trash, there was different meth methods for, for collecting trash, so we couldn't actually roll it up and score it. But the different methods include trash nets, which are um, put in front of the storm drain outfalls, and so it collects the trash before it gets into the Inner Harbor. The water wheels, they um, actually scoop trash out of the water and deposit it into a receptacle. Skimmers are people on boats that go out and skim the water. Um, they also have sweet street sweepers and um, volunteer pickup days. But I, I mean, I wanted to put these graphs up here to just show that obviously trash is a problem, problem when you have tons of trash um, being collected by the trash net and the water wheel. Um, and that's coming down from the city um, through the storm drains and then coming out into the inner harbor. So this doesn't even measure the trash that's like on the ground. This is actually the stuff that's coming into the water. Um, fish toxicity. This indicator answers the question, if I do catch fish in the inner harbor, is it safe to eat it? And um, Maryland Department of the Environment collects this data. Um, specifically, we looked at white perch data and um, Fish toxicity is really only can be assessed on a dec decadal scale, so it's not really appropriate for an annual report card. But um, their data goes from 2000 to 2010, and they do have a fish consumption advisory. They recommend one meal every other month, which means there's a high enough toxicity on average to warrant this advisory. Um, they're not expecting people to eat one meal a month. It's probably like all at one time and then not for a whole rest of the year kind of thing. But um, obviously there are contaminants in fish in this area. So in summary, um, the water quality indicators ended up being poor enough to average into a poor water quality index score. Benthic, uh, ma macroinvertebrates, SAV, and toxics all scored very poorly. And the human health and aesthetics indicators ended up scoring better than the ecological ones because the bacteria averaged out to a moderate, and then the fish and the trash is poor. So I just wanted to quickly um, acknowledge all the people that provided the data. Um, also, my colleagues that helped um, analyze the data, do the mapping and putting the report together. And um, our, especially our partners, Laurie Schwartz at the Waterfront Partnership of Baltimore, Fran Flanagan and Bill Stack at the Center for Watershed Protection um, for their funding. Thanks.